Hi everybody, welcome to my 13th beam video. In this video I'm going to introduce the concept of shear stresses in beams. So you probably know something what, about what shear stress is. After all, you've been plotting shear force diagrams for the longest time. But the shear forces in beams that we're interested in are not directly those, per se. They're the type of ones that are developed parallel to the beam's axes. I'm going to show you what I mean. Let me get a diagram of a beam happening. Alright, so here I have a beam, and we can imagine some sort of loading on here, right? You know, sort of crazy loading. And anyway, in re response to that, we have some sort of shear force. Alright, now I said before that the shear forces we're talking about are going to be the ones that are developed parallel to the axes of this beam. So there's going to be shear forces inside this beam, alright, going this way. Whatever, anyway, you want to think about it. Alright, so how does that work? Why would there be shear forces in there? The only shear forces that we were talking about were the ones that were going straight up and down. Alright, but if we remember, for equilibrium, every single part of that piece that's in equilibrium needs to be in equilibrium. Alright, and that makes sense because if you didn't have a piece that was in equilibrium, it would start to move. So if we take a cut of this beam, let's say here, and redraw that piece. Alright, we still have some shear force acting on here, not all of this. And now, since we cut it, we have two sections. Now, in reality, those two sections would be together. So, the only thing pre preventing them from falling apart, or from sliding apart, or anything, would be a force. So, whenever you make a cut, there's going to be another force here. And this force that's developed along this plane here, that's going to be some other shear force. And this is the shear force that we're talking about. Alright, so if you're ever confused about why would there be shear force running this way in beams when we're talking about shear force up and down, it's basically to make sure that every single piece of the beam remains in rotational equilibrium. So you can imagine without this, this whole section of the beam would start to rotate like this. So we need a shear force this way to provide a moment that pulls it this way. Now there's a whole derivation you can go through and find an equation, but I'm not going to do that for this video, it's kind of long. But as people want me to do it, I can always make a video, but for now I'll just leave it off. Let's give you the formula for the shear stress developed at any point along here. Equals to V, so the magnitude of this shear force here, Q of this cross section, from the centroid, all right, so if we have y measured this way, over i, the moment of inertia of the centroid, and b, the width of the piece. All right, another important thing is shear flow. We give the symbol f. It's basically equal to this over b. All right, so rearranging this equation, it's just vq over i. Alright, that's basically how many newtons per meter there are on the bottom of this thing. So you can imagine the shear force is not just in one single spot. It's spread it over, out over this whole piece. So this shear flow, if you will, that gives you the number or the amount of, like, let's say, newtons per meter there are on that piece. And this comes in later when we calculate things like spacings of nails and beams. Alright? But this here is the most important equation. For now, anyway, when we're calculating shear stresses. So we can imagine finding a V for a particular beam, right? a Q, an I, and then the width. All right? And just like we had when we had bending stresses, we had maximum bending stresses in beams due to different material properties. We're going to have the same thing here. All right? So beams and materials, they can fail in shear. And this is the way we can calculate where they will fail in shear. And, you know, the magnitude of 
you know, V that there can be. And V depends on the loading, of course. So how much loading can you have before something fails in shear? So what's the distribution of shear in a beam? All right, and we're just going to look at a simple cross-section for now. We'll just take the same cross-section we had up here. Let me redraw it. All right, so this green dotted line is the location of the neutral axes. In our case, it's a single material, so it's the same axis as the centroid of this piece. All right, so right in the middle at h by two. So if you recall, when we had bending stresses in beams, the distribution looked like this. All right, I have a positive bending moment. All right, so this one's pulling out this way, and this one's pushing this way for positive bending moment. This was for bending stresses in beams. All right, so the maximum location for the bending stress was always on the outside. All right, so this is creating some overall thing, and that's due to the bending moment. All right, now what about shear stress? All right, we can use this equation here, and we'll develop it in terms of y. All right, where y is measured from the neutral axes. So let's take a look at a section of the beam, a distance y up. So this section right here. All right, and let's redraw that. All right, so we know that this total width here, of course, is still B. And the location that we cut it at, Y, is right here. And the centroid is right at the center here. We'll call that Y bar, centroid. And the total height here, once it's the distance from the neutral axis to the top, that's H by 2. All right, now what we mean when we say Q, it's the... Q is the first moment of area. We're talking about always the first moment of area of the cross section, either only above the cut or only below the cut. Okay, so in most cases it's easier to go above the cut because if we do below the cut, we'd have, you know, some sort of, if we would take here, then we look at the moment or the moment, the first moment of area created by this section, you'd have to do positive and negative values because this piece is below the axis. So we're just looking above the axis. All right, so Q, say it again, the first moment of area of the piece above the point where you cut. All right, so let's develop Q for this piece in terms of Y. All right, because it turns out that's the only thing that depends on Y in this case, because B is fixed, I is just for the whole cross section. You never, don't need to care about where the cut is for I. And then B, all right, doesn't depend on Y either. It depends on where you are on the beam, but not where you are on the cross section. All right, so let's go ahead and develop Q as a function of Y. So we can say that H over 2 is equal to Y plus you know, this arbitrary distance here. All right, we'll call it D for our case. That's basically the height of the piece that's left over. So Y plus D. And then, of course, we can say D is equal to h over 2 minus y. 
So this is the height of this piece right here. Then the centroid is equal to y plus d by 2. All right, so this distance here plus half this distance, because the centroid of a square piece is always right at the middle. So it's going to be half of a d. All right, so substituting d in for over here, we can say And the most useful form of this equation all right this is the equation for the centroid of the piece now it's always quick to check and verify if this makes sense so when y equals 0 we should expect the centroid of the piece above the location where we cut to be h by 4 it should be right there if this red piece is all of that y is 0 and that's gone, h by 4, bingo. When y is h by 2, the centroid should be at that point too because we had like a tiny little sliver, actually nothing at all. So the centroid should be right at that location. So h by 2 plus h by 2, that's h by 2 right at the top, bingo. This equation is seeming to be correct. All right, so the area of this piece is just db. Oh, it's just this. All right, and now Q. What does A and Y centroid have to do with Q? Well, if we recall from other, your knowledge of one of my previous videos on first moment of area, I believe in my torsional bar section of my mechanics and materials videos, we know that Q is Y bar centroid times area. So in our case, Q of this piece in terms of y, so basically q of any section is going to be this times that. All right. So now let's plug it back into our uh, equation over here. Tau, and let's solve i in terms of this thing here. So I for this piece about its centroidal axes is bh cubed by 12. And plugging everything together we get Alright, so basically just plugged i into here and took v to just be some value and then b of course just to be b and then q I plugged in what I had over here. So this gives us the distribution of the shear stress as a function of y. Alright, so let's just take a look. When y is 0, what value do we get? All right, we get something like that. That's actually 3 over 2. So that's going to be out there somewhere. All right, it's positive. All right, so we're out there at y equals 0 because we're measuring y from here. Now, what happens if y equals h by 2? All right, we're going up here. And then what happens? Huh, this whole piece here becomes 0. So we're 0 up here. Now, what if y is minus h by 2? Well, then this term goes to 0. So we're zero at both top and bottom. And how about in between? Does it just go ch -ch -ch? No, it doesn't. Because if we would actually multiply this all out, you'd eventually get a y squared because of these two terms right here. All right, so it's going to be some sort of quadratic. All right, with a maximum value here. All right, and I say area because h times b is the area. 
All right, and this is actually kind of a handy little bit of information. If you have a square cross section, you don't even need to find Q or I or anything. It's just three halves of V over A for the maximum area. Now, I don't recommend you to do that on any of your homeworks because teachers don't really like that. If you just kind of use a cheat sort of thing, they want you to work through it all. But hey, I do it. Whatever. You can do it too. And something else, if we compare it to the bending stress, is our maximum bending stress is on the outside. Our maximum shear stress is on the inside. So when you're calculating a beam and they ask you what's the maximum value of a load if the maximum shear stress is this and the maximum bending stress is this, you need to calculate them both. See which one will fail first. And see what the like the minimum value of the load could be. Alright, so whenever you're evaluating for shear stress, always do it at the middle. Okay, so there's my bit of a explanation of shear stress. I hope you enjoyed. And I'll see you in my next bunch of videos where we go into some more examples of shear stress.